Hi, Nancy. Hi, Shane. What is the most rugged or Spartan-like conditions you've ever been in? Oh, that's a great question. Is it? I think it's pretty good. Have you been in? I More uh, rugged? Yes. I, you know, I used to be more rugged than I currently am. <laughs> I'll give you that much. But um, when I was like in when I was like in high school, I did one of those like backpacking trips, you know, during the summer. You okay. know, sometimes kids do that like yeah, yeah, yeah. out west. And for two weeks, I think we were like canoeing and hiking so didn't shower for two full weeks where were you you know like this out like it was i think it was like colorado the like colorado you know, river that, stuff yeah yeah like or maybe it was the green river or something is that a river i uh, sure i should know more about this than i do but i i've known you for a while i never knew this about I used you to be pretty hardcore yeah i i i i did not know that i think um for me my partner and I hiked the grand canyon a few years ago rim to rim um and like that that in and of itself is like a feat and yes and everything but that's not even the memorable part of that story like my partner lost her wallet when we were hiking up a a ridge in the middle of the canyon to try to find cell phone service so we could text our dog walker i just i i don't (laughs) she found her wallet ultimately it ended up working out but yeah when i when i think of a question like this like yeah i did this really amazing thing and it was like crunchy and everything else i'm like oh yeah and then we had this weird other part where we almost didn't get, weren't able to like fly back because she wouldn't have had her license because we had to text our dog walker. Very important. Very important. Science is fascinating, but don't just take my word for it. Join us as we hear stories from scientists for everyone. I'm Shane Hanlon. And I'm Nancy Boppy. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. So today's question of the week was inspired by a trek to Antarctica. Our guest today does some really amazing research in remote places. And while the conditions there in the place are rough enough, it turns out getting there can present its own mm, unique challenges. I feel like you're trying to like say something without saying it. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to say something <laughs> without saying it. Uh, it'll be, let's just say it'll be better coming from our guest. So let's get into it. Our interviewer was Ashley Hamer. My name is Pacifica Summers. I am a microbial ecologist at the University of Colorado Boulder. Formally, my job title is research associate. I am postdoctoral, meaning I have my PhD, but I'm not a full-time faculty member. I am a postdoctoral research associate, so I work on different research projects funded by research grants, mostly from federal agencies. I mostly study microscopic life at the ends of the earth. I'm interested in what we can learn about ecosystems around us and even those that live inside us, the microscopic ecosystems that make up our microbiomes from the natural laboratories of simpler ecosystems that you find, say, in melt holes on glaciers, using them as natural test tubes to study how ecosystems develop and organize at the microscopic scale. I have been to Antarctica three times, always for the summer research season. So that's November through January uh, or November through February in the Austral summer. And I got there through the U.S. Antarctic program each time. So how you get there depends on which program you're going with and which research base or camp you are going to. In my case, I was working in the McMurdo Dry Valleys of Antarctica, so I was based from McMurdo Station. So the way we get there is we fly first to Christchurch, New Zealand via commercial air. There, the U.S. Antarctic program outfits us with those classic red parkas that you see and puts us on an Air Force plane, usually a U.S. Air Force plane, but because our program cooperates closely with New Zealand's program, sometimes it's a Royal New Zealand Air Force plane. And if you go early in the season or leave late in the season, the ice runways that you land on when you get to McMurdo Station on the coast of Antarctica are solid enough that they can fly the C-17 jets. And those are reasonably comfortable. They're reasonably large. They take about five hours to get there. If you are going when it's a little bit warmer in December near the summer solstice, those ice runways cannot support the C-17. Then they, they need to fly you on a C-150, the Hercules propeller plane. So it takes more like eight hours. 
and you are crammed in there shoulder to shoulder and with your knees in or locking with the people across from you sitting on these mesh like mesh kind of webbing seats and you, the pro tip is to put your big red parka behind you to create some kind of a a seat back and a little bit more comfortable situation in there and the bathroom is a bucket behind a curtain so you climb over everybody's knees to the end of the row and you step behind the curtain and I was aware that it was a bucket behind a curtain but what I didn't expect was that <laughs> there's not like a lot of floor space around that to really get situated if you're a lady over that bucket so there's like a ladder that's like on its side so it's like kind of standing on luggage and ladder pieces balancing over this <laughs> and you're you're on this propeller plane for like an eight hour flight plus or minus time on the ground on either side so that was I'd an be afraid experience. of spilling i mean <laughs> does it ever spill <laughs> I, I didn't have that experience. They they locked that bucket down pretty well. Okay. And there's a lid, I think. But, you know, when you're on the continent of Antarctica, they also take environmental protection really seriously. So you can't just pee on the ground like you can when you're hiking and camping here in the mm. States. You have to collect it. If you're not near a bathroom, you got to carry your pee bottles with you and pee into your pee bottles. And so for some of us, a funnel is very helpful for that endeavor as well. So there's a lot of interesting bathroom situations there. But once we land in McMurdo, we spend a few days at the research station there in dorms, getting all of our safety trainings. And then to get to the camp and the glaciers that I work on in the McMurdo Dry Valleys, I board a a helicopter and it's about a 45 minute helicopter flight over to our actual research camp and research areas. So that's the whole journey out to to get there. And then how long do you stay? I was there for approximately three months, each of the three seasons I was there, between two and four months each time. Okay, so the full the full summer. Wow. Yes, but that means I've never seen darkness. I've only seen polar sunlight. And just last summer, I finally became a bipolar researcher, I like to say, and I went on my first field expedition to the Arctic, to Svalbard, where I'm working at 79 degrees north instead of 79 degrees south, where I worked in Antarctica. But I was there again during the summer and once again only saw the midnight sun. And I'm extremely excited that next Monday I am flying back to Svalbard to conduct our seasonal winter sampling on this this Svalbard project, this high Arctic project. And so I'll be there to see actual sunsets and darkness and maybe weather permitting and forecast permitting, I'll even see the northern lights. I have to say, when I when I talk about the McMurdo Dry Valleys of Antarctica, that is a truly special place in terms of the austere beauty and sort of menace of the environment. It was called by the first explorers, the Scots party that first went up the Taylor Valley, it was called the Valley of the Dead. And that might be because of all the mummified seals lying around. They're actually mummified seals and penguin skeletons because when these animals get lost and wander up the valley, there's nothing for them to eat and they die. And they don't decompose because microbial life is so slow in that dry and cold environment that they just dry out. So it's it's a very intimidating environment, but it's very quiet. You don't have airplanes flying overhead. You don't have traffic. You don't even have animals running through the underbrush. You don't even have underbrush. You don't have plants except like moss. So it's it's beautiful and austere. And as I mentioned, it drives the community of people in that environment to really have to come together and work together and form a really special kind of community. We do have internet out there most days, unless it snows on and the snow blocks the solar panels that feed the radio repeaters that send the internet, but the internet's very slow even when we do get it. So it's not like here where you're connected. You don't have your cell phone. You can barely load your email. So we're really interacting with each other and depending on one another. And then for a, a final kind of parting words, what, what words of advice would you have for someone who's going into science or, or wanting to follow in your footsteps? Ooh, that's, that's a tough one. Honestly, I would say don't worry so much about things. They will work out or they won't. <laughs> um, there are many ways to be a scientist. If you find out that maybe you're not as good at some elements, like you're not as good at 
sterile technique, or you're not as good at the mathematical pieces, or you're not as good at the coding pieces, or you're not as good at the hiking far distances to collect the data that you need from the field pieces. There are all those other complementary pieces, and there's just the the question and the curiosity piece and the communication piece. So there are, there are many ways to be a scientist. So focus on your strengths uh, and round yourself out and try everything, but don't don't worry, nothing is as high stakes as it feels at the time. So Nancy, what's the most high stakes job you've ever had? I don't know, like high stakes, but, um, you know, I was thinking I was like high stakes, but, 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 but. you remember that year at the fall meeting when um, Mike Bloomberg, who was running for president at the time, oh showed up unannounced, I mean, not unannounced, but with a day notice. I that was pretty intense. That. I mean, yeah. I had to coordinate all the media, got like, you know, I had to, <laughs> the press person told me to lock down the riser, just the press <laughs> riser where the, where the cameras are. It was, it was an intense time. Did you, did you enjoy that? It was, it was fun. It was cool. And then it's like they rush in, the whole thing happens, Mike Bloomberg, blah, yeah. and then it's and then it's done. You know what I mean? And, and then it's just, over. It's just like wreckage. Yeah, and, oh exactly. Exactly. I uh I worked on Capitol Hill for a little bit. That's actually uh how I or why I moved to DC. And I honestly like to me it felt really important. I don't I don't, you don't know if it actually was. I don't know if it was. I'm, honestly, I, I frankly prefer like our nice kind of nonprofit space. It's it's uh, it's much more my speed. Uh, and I want to thank Pacifica for putting things into perspective. Special thanks to Ashley Hamer for conducting the interview, NASA for sponsoring this series, and to Karen Romano Young for her illustration of Pacifica. This episode was produced by me with audio engineering from Colin Warren. We would love to hear your thoughts. Please rate and review us. And you can always find new episodes on your favorite podcasting app or at thirdpodfromthesun.com. Thanks all. And we'll see you next week. What is the most... <laughs> Sorry. I just, I just think of Monty Python. What is your favorite color? All right. Let's try this again.